I should, uh, well, first of all, let me welcome you on behalf of the Forum for European Philosophy and, to this evening. And I should explain before I say anything else that I'm not, as it says on the screen, Catherine O'Dar. Uh, I'm in fact Alan Montefiore, and I'm the, the president of the Forum for European Philosophy. <laughs> but that put aside very rapidly. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to be able to welcome Alain de Botton back mm -hmm. to the Forum tonight. Alain has been one of our most um, regular and reliable supporters and has spoken for us on a number of previous occasions and I'm also delighted to see so many of you are here to join in welcoming him back. I don't think he needs a very long introduction. He's uh, written, of course, many books which most, most of you will have read, I think, at least some of them. Uh, I should give you... I, I, would fail to uh, remember them all by heart, I'm sure, but the first on the one I would like to mention, How Proust Can Change Your Life, is one which I read a very long time ago with enormous pleasure. Uh, whether it changed my life or not, I don't know, but it certainly cheered me up and it was a great read. The Constellations of Philosophy are also fairly consoling. And then um, Art of Trouble, Status Anxiety, that's a bit more worrying, of course. The Architecture of Happiness, of Pleasures and Sorrows of Work, of which he's going to talk to you about tonight. But I should perhaps just add that he had the rather unusual post of philosopher in residence at, the, at Heathrow. And he has written, written about his experiences there. And conceivably, he may actually put in a word or two to say what it's like to be a philosopher in residence at Heathrow. After the talk, there will be a very brief and rapid uh, book signing. Uh, let's say signing of Alan's book, the subject of which he's talking about tonight. But I don't want to waste more of your time by going on talking myself. Uh, I now turn it over to Alan. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, are these mics on? This mic is on. Yep. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, the subject of uh, of my new book on on work and. Um, Hopefully, then, we'll have time for a discussion. I'm very keen that it's not just me talking tonight, so, um, so do come back at me with uh, thoughts and ideas. But let me, let me introduce uh, some ideas uh, first. I think when we're thinking about the subject of work, um, it's important to recognize that our ideas about work are very, very strange indeed. We're often struck by the um, modernity and... Um, sort of exemplary nature of our technology, but it's not really our technology that sets us apart uh, from previous generations in, uh, in work, so much as our attitudes to work, in particular the vision that we have, that work could make us happy. Um, this is a very striking idea. Um, anybody who's been through uh, the UK's uh, education system, uh, both at a secondary and at a higher level, will have imbibed uh, a vision that the point of work is not merely money. The point of work is to find fulfillment, uh, and anything less than that is somehow a betrayal of certain hopes that are almost naturally inculcated by uh, the education system. So to be modern is to expect uh, that we may uh, uh, find happiness through work. Um, of course, it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, you'll all know that feeling that you get on a Sunday evening. Um, when, you know, just when the sun is setting and the gap between your hopes for your working life and the reality of your working life become very, very obvious. Um, best to take to the bed and normally by about 8 p.m. the worst is over. But it's, a, it's not merely a private experience, I think, that I'm telling you. I think it's a, it, it's a broader uh, phenomenon. It's, it's the moment when the weekend uh, crashes up into uh, certain kind of psychological realities um, of, of our working lives. Um, I think that the, um, the centrality of uh, the idea of happiness um, uh, lying at the core of our attitudes to work is uh, so modern that it helps to just scroll back in time, get a little bit of a historical perspective on this. If you ask Aristotle uh, what work was, he would tell you straight away that work was slavery. Uh, for Aristotle, um, uh, anyone who is dependent on another human being for their wages, for their survival, is a slave. They may not be technically a slave, but that is what Aristotle would call them. This very dark vision of work continues in the Christian era uh, with the idea that um, work is not incidentally uh, painful. It is 
uh, painful by necessity, that work is a way of paying off the sins of Adam and Eve, uh, and therefore to complain about um, uh, the evils of work is to misunderstand the nature of existence. This is simply a fact uh, of existence. This very, very dark vision of work starts to fracture uh, in the early modern period. Um, I know I'm talking in a university context, so forgive me for generalizations, but in about 1750, attitudes to work uh, start to change. They really do start to change uh, around then. 1750 is the publication date of Diderot's Encyclopédie, uh, this famous uh, work that for the first time eulogizes ordinary occupations, ordinary crafts, uh, we, we, we would call them. So there are chapters in this encyclopedia on such uh, uh, jobs as uh, making bread, uh, forging an anchor, uh, working as a blacksmith. Um, these are suddenly things that uh, the bourgeois world, the new bourgeois world that is taking shape, starts to value uh, for, for the first time. Um, and in voices like those of uh, Diderot, but also uh, men like uh, Rousseau uh, or Benjamin Franklin in the United States, uh, you have a new approach to work, that work can be not slavery, but precisely an escape from enslavement. It's a way of realizing ourselves. It's a way of achieving authenticity. Uh, it's a way of creating our, um, our, our individuality. All these very modern concepts that we now take to absolutely for granted starting to crystallize uh, in the middle of the 18th century. It's intriguing that it's at exactly this sort of time um, that there are new attitudes to love. Um, again, historians of ideas have long pointed out that in about the middle of the 18th century, you have a new uh, idea uh, cropping up about marriage. Um, it used to be assumed that uh, the reasons why you would marry somebody uh, would be strictly dynastic or practical. They would be to raise children, to unite your strip of land with a neighbor's strip of land, um, but you didn't do it for love. Suddenly, new idea, astonishing idea, many of us still wrestling with it, uh, that you can marry for love um, and that that should be one of the principal motives uh, uh, for, for marriage. And we see, the reason I'm mentioning is, is, is there's a comparable uh, union here of necessity and pleasure. So work um, is no longer just for money. Uh, and marriage is no longer just for procreation or dynastic concerns. Uh, in both cases, there is an element of fulfillment uh, that is being uh, uh, proposed. And we are the heirs of these two very important ideas, that love and work can deliver. Freud, in this sense, an archetypal modern, uh, famously said that the uh, two pillars of our satisfaction are work and love. Um, and we are very much, we, we, we live that philosophy, which is incidentally why it's very hard to find a human being these days uh, in uh, our, our society who isn't suffering from either a crisis of love or work, or perhaps, unfortunately, both. Um, but these are regular occurrences that punctuate the life of the modern self, um, and they do so, as I say, not incidentally, but structurally. Um, and so these are beautiful ideas, um, but they're also very, very challenging ones. And that's, in a way, a sort of starting point for my thinking uh, about this subject. I, I wanted to write a book about work. Um, Partly because uh, it doesn't get written about very much. Um, I should qualify this, but um, there are, of course, lots of books on economics. Um, this is the place to mention them. But economics, an economic vision of work, is, of course, only one slice of what work is about. Um, when you read the Financial Times and you hear the past year in a company's life summed up, uh, that is, of course, a very narrow summary of the activities of what might be tens of thousands of people. Um, and, uh, and there is, of course, a whole other uh, human side to the story that I was tempted to, to bring out. If you read fiction, um, there is, of course, very little data on, on the world of work. If you were to take a proverbial Martian to Waterstones and uh, introduce um, it to the spread of uh, most novels on, on the front table, they'd come away with an impression that basically human beings spend their time uh, falling in love, um, squabbling with their families, occasionally murdering one another. But what they don't do is to go to the office. Um, they don't have jobs because, because writers, on the whole, only know about the job of writing. Um, and uh, this puts a severe limit on their own imaginations uh, as to what other people uh, are, are doing. So there's a curious silence about this activity uh, that is absolutely the centre of our culture. Um, there's an imaginative uh, uh, quiet. There's almost an idea which you, crop up, which you see cropping up in guidebooks that any time that is leisure time should not be focused on anything to do with the world of work. Um, and so if you read guidebooks to most countries, the th one thing that's always missing 
uh, or very often missing, is any mention of how the people in the landscape through which you're traveling are making their living. Uh, you hear a lot about you know, the basilica on the hillside, uh, the painting of certain frescoes, etc. But no one's telling you how money is being made. And this is, again, I think not just a, 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 a kind of coincidence. This is, is plugged into our deep suspicion of an interest in production um, in our moments of leisure. Production, the world of production, uh, is not seen as something that we should be taking an interest in in our hours of what should be, in the capitalist model, consumption. So production and consumption should be kept very separate. It wasn't always the case. You know, in the 18th century, when um, uh, English aristocratic uh, young men traveled to the continent on their so-called grand tours, um, they would be looking out not just for the culture of the countries that they visited, but also the economies, in the broader sense, the economies of the lands they, they traveled through. So uh, an 18th century tourist visiting, say, Naples uh, would not just head straight to the churches and the palaces, uh, they would be looking at the aqueduct, uh, they would be thinking of uh, the naval yards, of uh, the way that uh, wheat was stored uh, in the city, etc. And this was seen as a, a legitimate uh, source of, uh, of curiosity. Uh, but now uh, uh, no more. Um, it's interesting that the, the one group of people who are allowed to be curious about all this um, are the people who uh, don't, or not, at least not supposed to work, and that's children. Um, children are allowed to be curious about the working world. There's a, uh, I've got a three and a five year old, and they're both absolutely fascinated by a book uh, by the American children's author, Richard Scarry, called What Do People Do All Day? And I don't know if you, uh, if you know it, but I wanted to call my book, What Do People Do All Day? I think it's a great title. Um, uh, but this book, What Do People Do All Day, is divided into 10 chapters that basically um, just looks at how stuff is done, how stuff is made, how paper is made, how electricity is generated, how coal is dug out of the ground, etc. Uh, and children are allowed and, and are uh, very very fascinated uh, by this. But in the adult world, as I say, there's a curious uh, kind of silence. Not always and in all areas. I mean, um, if you switch on the television, there are a few shows that will tell you quite a lot about the working world. Uh, TV dramas are good at telling you about the world of law, uh, also the world of uh, medicine and nursing, uh, and the world of criminality. Uh, but if you're interested in a career outside of those three areas, um, <laughs> uh, I would urge you to be, um, then, uh, then there's a curious silence. I've never seen a TV drama about logistics. Um, uh, or <laughs> accountancy, uh, etc. So that's why I was challenged precisely to write chapters on occupations like the world of logistics or the world of, of accountancy. Another thing that sort of spurred me on um, was a group of people that I came across uh, down at Tilbury Docks. People forget that London is still a very busy port. The port of London uh, is, is still uh, uh, remarkably busy day and night, um, shipping in the uh, stuff that keeps London going in many ways. Uh, but the fashionable question in, in London is always, you know, what's on at the National Gallery, not what's coming in at Tilbury Docks. But some extraordinary stuff uh, is coming in. If you go down there any day of the week, you will see uh, very, very interesting uh, cargo. No one's looking. In fact, it's very, very hard to spend any time there because the place is surrounded by barbed wire and threatening signs of what will happen to you if you linger. Um, but there are... Uh, there, there, I did come across a small group of people, uh, many of them with the proverbial beards uh, and thick sole shoes, um, ship spotters. Uh, there are a group, normally there's a jetty that you can go to uh, opposite Tilbury Docks, and um, there's always a group of people there with binoculars uh, spotting the cargo as it uh, uh, comes in and out. Um, I, I was very interested in what they were doing. I wasn't so interested, I guess, in what they were doing with the objects of their curiosity, because really uh, all they seemed concerned about was length uh, and type of engines. Um, and they, they reminded me of uh, somebody who's fallen deeply in love with someone, and all they can think of doing is sort of measuring various parts of uh, her or his anatomy. Uh, it seemed a very limited uh, uh, direction of curiosity. Uh, but nevertheless, I like the way they were being curious about this, as I say, very neglected part of uh, the world, which is uh, its working uh, cogs. It's curiously uh, neglected uh, uh, parts. Um, so what I want to do tonight is maybe dip into uh, different um, uh, working environments and some of the ideas that I came across as I journeyed through them. Uh, one of the worlds that I wanted to explore was the world of logistics. Uh, logistics, as I say, uh, is that um, uh, a part of the economy um, uh, invested in getting stuff around. Uh, it's a huge employer of, of people, especially in the UK. Um, and, uh, and it's a reflection, really, of how much of the stuff that we consume comes from somewhere else. Uh, you know, 200 years ago, uh, we consumed very little, but we tended to know where it came from. It came from the vicinity, and we would tend to know the people who made it, who assembled it. Uh, we'd have a personal relationship with, um, uh, with the producers 
uh, whose, um, whose goods we depended upon. Uh, nowadays, a huge choice, but very, very little uh, connection. And that loss of connection uh, has led to a loss of all sorts of uh, uh, feelings. It's led to uh, a feeling, as Marx famously put it, of alienation, where we literally do not understand um, where the goods and services we rely on were produced. It leads to feelings of guilt, as we imagine the worst. Um, and it also leads to feelings of a loss of, of a sense of wonder, uh, because there are some rather astonishing things that lie behind um, those little uh, signs called things like made in Thailand. Uh, it isn't necessarily always <coughs> awful. Uh, it, uh, it is anyway uh, extremely interesting uh, in, in all cases. But as I say, we're not encouraged in any way to, take, to be curious about it. The emphasis of all uh, 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 producers uh, is on... Um, uh, uh, is, is on the act of consumption. Uh, that's what you're being uh, directed to. I felt this, um, uh, 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 we, you heard that I've spent some time at Heathrow uh, this summer, and I was struck by the way, I, I spent some time looking at how airline meals are assembled, and it strikes me that um, watching how an airline meal is made is infinitely more interesting than actually eating it. Uh, but it is not something that an airport will ever allow you to do um, if you're just an ordinary member of the public. The, the processes by which an airline uh, works and operates and uh, uh, is, is, is refueled and replenished uh, is, is strictly off limits. Um, and it's not just practical, it's not about security, there's an imaginative problem. You're not supposed to be interested in it. Uh, that's, not what, um, uh, that's not what the point of it is. And so there's a huge loss in that, and I wanted to uh, uh, think about that. I remember I, one day, I, one night, I was um, off the M25 in a giant uh, warehouse owned by Sainsbury's, which feeds all the Sainsbury's stores within the M25. The word cathedral, much overused, but this really was the size of many, many cathedrals. And there was an area uh, in, in, uh, in there it was at least the size of this building, devoted to uh, what was called what's called exotic fish, which is any fish caught outside of the UK territorial waters. And there was a section about the size of this hall devoted simply to tuna steaks. And I remember talking to uh, the, the warehouse uh, manager and asking him uh, where these uh, steaks had come from and, and, and when. And he informed me that they'd all come from the Indian Ocean and would have been in the ocean about 22 hours before and would have to be by law consumed and uh, on people's plates in the next 48 hours. So an incredibly tight window uh, of, uh, of time. Um, and it was then that I uh, developed this uh, a curious and, and no doubt slightly insane um, desire to try and follow a fish back from the ocean to the plate. Uh, and I then spent the next sort of three or four months trying to uh, track down every single person who came in touch with uh, a, a, um, a representative fish. Uh, and um, it could have been anything, really. It could have been iron ore from the Western Australian desert that I would have followed to the car factories of Mexico or whatever. The point was not so much what it was, but to try and follow a journey, um, uh, to try and recover those imaginative links. Because I think one of the things that art can hope to do in the age of advanced logistics is to reconnect us, to make for us imaginatively those connections uh, that um, uh, the process of production are trying to edit out constantly and therefore um, give us back an Im that imaginative connection uh, to people and processes uh, that uh, uh, modern technology and um, uh, management has, has robbed us of. So, um, that was, yes, some thoughts about, um, uh, about logistics. Another area that I went to look at was the world uh, of career counselling. Um, I don't know if any of you here come from that world, but it is a, a fascinating world. Um, in, in a sense, the job of being a career counsellor is the most important job in the world. It's the job that will tell people what job they should do um, and is absolutely central, as I say, to our modern imaginative ideas of, of, of happiness. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about uh, being confused about what work you want to do um, is that uh, um, we have a very hard time. We, we, it's very easy to know that you're dissatisfied, very hard to know what might make you more satisfied. And in that sense, it's different from other kinds of unhappiness. If you talk to an unhappy lover and you say, you know, what's wrong with your situation, that person will be able to tell you quite clearly what is wrong and at least the imaginative solution to their problem. They would say, you know, if only my partner were X, Y, and Z, etc. People who are unhappy in their jobs very often have a very difficult time trying to say what might make them happier. And this is where the job of career counselling, that's what the job of career counselling is kind of founded upon, that mystery. Um, 
The, uh, the career counsellor I went to see, who operated from uh, uh, his home in South London, um, his, uh, his assumption is that the reason why many of us are so confused about our careers uh, and can't readily think of alternatives uh, is that we're very, very concerned with something that has the shape of a career, something that will deliver the status and income that we associate with that word uh, career. Uh, and uh, he thinks, I think interestingly, uh, that that cuts us off from discovering or from getting in touch with the spontaneous sources of interest which might guide us more accurately to our genuine uh, uh, interests and talents. So the first thing that he does when people come in to see him is that he sits them down and tells them to stop thinking about what job they should do. Instead, he gives them a piece of paper and tells them to write a list without thinking too much about what they're writing, um, telling, them, telling him um, the sort of things they're interested in. And he makes it deliberately very open. It could be anything from, you know, you like drinking milk to chatting to your grandmother to going for a country walk uh, to fantasizing that you run a fish and chip shop. It doesn't matter what it is, put it down. Um, um, and this then becomes the basis for a sustained, uh, sometimes month-long uh, 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 series of investigations into um, the origins of certain interests, etc. He compares the assembly of a workable idea of what you might do with your life to a treasure hunter who's uh, going over the ground with a, a metal detector and listening out for faint beeps of interest. Um, and he thinks that one of the worst ideas that we have is, that, um, is the idea of a calling, uh, you know, it's a, in, in medieval English, this idea of a calling uh, came uh, to be popularly spoken about. And it's really the idea that, um, uh, that many of us are likely to receive a sign from God about how we should direct our careers, uh, that literally we will get a sign from above. And um, uh, this career counselor thought that from a secular point of view, this is nonsense, but still very influential, that many of us still half expect that at some point the sky will open and a finger will point to us and say, you know, accountancy for you and uh, uh, you know, academia for you, etc. Uh, and it just doesn't happen. Most of us, as he puts it, have these beeps of interest that are guiding us and nothing stronger. And the point is to try and um, uh, um, uh, assemble these into something that's, uh, that's coherent, which will depend on a long process of, of introspection. It is, of course, very, very hard to change career once you're in a particular path. And one of the reasons uh, why is that the assumptions of our friends uh, and our families place enormous pressure on us. Um, and um, so one of the things you might want to do if considering a career change is to change your friends, or you might need to, um, because people hold us back through their assumptions. They say things to us like, oh, I never, I never imagined you as someone who thought about that or something. And that can really restrict us. Um, and uh, declaring to others, to our immediate circle, that we have decided to make a change is an incredibly uh, painful process, in some ways analogous to um, uh, announcing a, a change in one's sexuality. Uh, it's, you know, if you imagine you gather your family round and uh, you tell them, I've got something very important to, to say to you. Your sister runs upstairs crying, going, I always knew it. Um, <laughs> and you say, no, you know, I, I, you always thought of me as an accountant, but, but really I'm a landscape gardener. And this, as I say, it can be a very, very uh, painful process. But it, it teaches us, I suppose, uh, to be aware that what's on the business card is only a, a very sharp abbreviation of the true person. Um, we live in a world where one of the first questions that you always feel in any social encounter is, what do you do? Uh, and, and of course, it's that, that moment uh, that so many of us want to say, I do X, but I hope for Y. Uh, and yet this is something that uh, an impatient world very uh, seldom gives us uh, a time for. Um, all this said, I'm not entirely sympathetic to um, career counseling. I think in many ways, it's a, a deeply and naively apolitical process um, in the sense that it suggests that the only reason why people don't end up in the careers they want to have uh, is that they haven't discovered uh, that career within themselves. I, in other words, it uh, shifts the emphasis from the, uh, from the economic and the political to the psychological in a way which I think is often unfair to reality. Um, and uh, so that's one problem. I think the other problem sometimes is, it's, is, is the over-optimism that's built into uh, the whole job. It sometimes reminds me of um, creative writing teaching that I've done a bit of. Um, and the assumption in creative writing teaching is that everybody has got it in them to be a great writer, um, which I, I sadly don't think is true. And the assumption of, co of career counseling, again, is that everybody is everybody's destiny uh, to have uh, a, a glorious and authentic and uh, meaningful career, which again, uh, the political and economic system uh, prevents us from having, um, let alone our own uh, deficiencies and, uh, and, and inner challenges. So a kind of naivety there. Um, temperamentally, I'm more attracted, I suppose, to a vision of the workplace as one in which um, we can never 
uh, uh, expect that um, more than a share of us will be in jobs that accurately reflect our, our talents. Uh, we talk of waste all the time, wasting electricity, wasting water, wasting resources. Of course, the one resource that we continue to waste in prodigious quantities is human life, uh, our own and those of others. Uh, and um, uh, it's certainly my hope that um, in the 21st century, we'll get slightly cleverer at managing to extract from people those talents which they themselves are not aware of um, and uh, uh, necessarily in which we all struggle to, um, uh, to get a grip on. Um, there's a lovely concept in St. Augustine where he um, ridicules and um, uh, declares a sin the idea that um, all of us are necessarily in the right jobs, or as he puts it, posts. He says it's a sin to judge a man by his post. Um, and in that he means that um, the post that we have on Earth uh, is likely to have uh, come our way through all sorts of series of accidents, chances, and other posts that we might have had have gone missing uh, through similar processes of accidents. And so we must be very careful in, in judging people. Um, and this flies in the face of the modern meritocratic vision of, of life, where um, politicians on all sides of the political spectrum are always trying to help us to create a meritocracy, a, a, a society where everybody will end up where they merit uh, being. And uh, while many of the steps, many, many meritocratic steps are of course admirable, the idea that you can ever get to a true meritocracy is insane and cruel uh, because ultimately we can never um, uh, 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 end up ourselves exploiting all our talents and no one else will either. And so bearing that in mind in any new social encounter seems um, a, 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 a very, a, you know, very important part of civilization. Um, let me move on to another uh, working environment and another set of ideas. Um, the other, another uh, uh, job that I went to investigate was the world of biscuit manufacture. I went to hang out with um, the UK's largest biscuit company, which is called United Biscuits. Uh, they make lots of, uh, they're the second in the bag nut market, uh, but they're biggest in biscuits. And they make uh, popular household names like uh, McVitie's uh, and uh, the McJaffa Cakes, and they also make hula hoops and KP Skips, etc. Huge organization. Um, and I went to, they let me in uh, to observe uh, the launch of a new biscuit um, a huge launch for them, uh, many millions of pounds invested in it, called The Moment. I don't know if any of you have ever eaten uh, McVitie's Moment. Um, you shouldn't have done, because uh, all biscuits have a demographic. I didn't know this, but all biscuits have a very tightly defined uh, target audience. The Moment is designed for a 26 to 36-year-old female audience, uh, lower income, living in the north of England. Um, <laughs> Uh, as you're wheeling your supermarket trolley uh, down, down the aisle, long before you know what you want to eat in biscuit-wise, uh, the biscuit knows uh, that you're coming and uh, adjusted <laughs> itself. So you can learn an awful lot about, <clears throat> about people by asking them what their favourite uh, biscuit is. My favourite biscuit is a Jaffa cake, uh, which is um, apparently a, it's sort of secret identity from a marketing point of view. Yeah, the Jaffa cake is a, is a biscuit for people who are very interested uh, in a healthy, active lifestyle based on healthy nutrition, but uh, are not actually going to do any of that. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's the Jaffa cake. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think 15,000 people working at United Biscuits across a number of manufacturing sites. And one of the things I soon found um, uh, talking to people at uh, United Biscuits is that I couldn't understand what their jobs were. You know, when I, when I asked that proverbial question, what do you do? Um, it took normally about five or six other questions, follow-up questions, before I could get a sense of what they were doing. They were doing things like uh, being a, uh, you know, packaging technologists or data systems analysts, very, very hard to understand. Now, um, this, you'll probably have observed this phenomenon in many uh, social situations. You know, generally nowadays, when you uh, get into conversation about jobs, it, it can be very hard to understand immediately what someone is up to. Um, this is absolutely right. Uh, uh, from an economic point of view. Economists, I'm sure some of them in the room, uh, will know uh, that that is the basis of our, our assumptions of how societies get wealthy, specialization, uh, economic specialization. Um, for the economist Wilfredo Pareto, <coughs> there's a, a, a cast iron law that suggests that the more specialized a society is, the higher uh, its, um, uh, its wealth will be. Uh, there's no point uh, train drivers coming home in the evening and starting to make yogurt uh, or brain surgeons having a go at making children's clothes. You specialize in a certain area and then, of course, trade uh, your, um, uh, uh, your, 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 your goods uh, with others. And that's the way to wealth. Um, it is, of course, a very, very um, a productive way from an economic point of view, but there is a, a human cost, as I'm not the first to point out, and this is what I was interested in. What is the human cost of this economic uh, gain? And I think that one of the ways to point to it is with the word meaning. Um, 
One of the things that I kept finding uh, in my time at United Biscuits was that word meaning. Many of the people there are earning uh, very good money, um, but uh, many of them uh, on Facebook and in private situations when I talk to them uh, would admit to problems of meaning. In other words, they say, what on earth is the meaning of what I'm doing? And that word, because that word kept coming up, I sort of thought, well, what, what is that word meaning? What, what do people mean when they use that word? Um, I think that one of the things we desperately want from our work uh, is to change the world for the better. It's not a fashionable idea because the, the leading economic idea is that we're out for ourselves to maximize our income. Of course we are from many points of view. But there is also a very, very powerful drive in us to make a difference to other people's lives for the better, to either reduce suffering uh, in others or to increase pleasure. Um, reducing suffering, you know, being a brain surgeon, a nurse, etc. <coughs> These are obviously very meaningful jobs, but there are also, um, uh, you know, any job that increases pleasure is partaking in the same sort of process. If you're reuniting somebody with their lost luggage or sanding a stair banister, um, you, you are, at the end of the day, leaving the world slightly better than you found it at the beginning. And this is an absolutely essential part, I think, of um, a, a meaningful uh, life and hence a satisfied uh, working life. Uh, don't get me wrong, making biscuits is, in a sense, a meaningful activity. Um, anyone who's ever been hungry <coughs> at 11 o'clock knows that, you know, thank goodness that um, McVitie's exists and uh, there are things we can uh, get our teeth into. The problem is it doesn't feel very meaningful. Um, in many links across those 15,000 people, um, meaning is lost, and that's to do with specialization. The links between uh, the product uh, and its manufacturing processes are so large <coughs> that we lose, uh, as a worker, <coughs> we lose an imaginative connection with um, the, the products that we're, that we're making. So biscuits, of course, used to be an artisanal process. The flour and the other ingredients would come in in the morning. You turn them into biscuits. You'd see uh, the pleasure on someone's face uh, in the evening, and it was all extremely tangible. Now, if you're employee 8,300 uh, in the office in Hayes, where United Biscuits is based, um, uh, you, know, you might have a job insuring the pallets uh, that um, are used when transferring biscuits around different sites uh, that United Biscuits use around the UK. That's very, very far from the whole business of actually consuming, producing um, uh, the biscuit in its uh, artisanal form. And this leads to feelings of, as I say, uh, uh, meaninglessness. Um, and <coughs> this is something the industrial world uh, uh, struggles with and that I w was keen to, uh, to, to, to investigate. Um, let me, um, let me carry on and um, dip into another area of working life, which is the world of accountancy, uh, which I went to see. Um, partly I was challenged to write about accountants because um, it's, accountancy is the proverbial boring job. Uh, accountants tend to apologize when they declare what they do, and this seemed, this seemed impossible. It couldn't be possible that a, a job that's so at the center of economic life could be so uh, truly boring, and I was challenged to find out, and um, uh, uh, was graciously given a, uh, an opportunity to do so by um, uh, a firm that I sadly, subsequently, am uh, not allowed to name for legal reasons, but it's the second largest accountancy firm uh, in the world, and they've got offices uh, near Tower Bridge. Um, <coughs> but I can't go further. Anyway, a very large, these offices, very, very large, 10,000 people working on this site, um, and um, I went to hang out in this sort of vast white collar factory, I suppose. And I was very interested in lots of uh, factors of um, life in this, uh, uh, in this organization. One of the things I was keen to look at was the issue of motivation. Um, motivation is absolutely central to what we would now call the art or pseudoscience of management. Um, what are management books about? They're basically about how to motivate a, a workforce. Now, motivation used to be very easy. Um, the only thing you needed uh, uh, to motivate a workforce in the good old days was a whip. Um, if people were not working hard enough, you, you would hit them and then you know, they would heave stones and, and uh, move their oars with, with greater speed. Um, uh, but of course, uh, unfortunately, this has really become a taboo in most modern workplaces. You can't hit your employees uh, and this has led to, um, uh, to, to, to the art of, uh, of management. Uh, and right at the core, I suppose, of the art of, of, the art of management is the recognition uh, that an unhappy workforce is going to be a, an unproductive one. And this is, as I say, deeply unfortunate because it means uh, that management has to immerse itself in questions of what makes workers happy, which is, as I say, an extremely tricky one, very expensive one, but there seems no other way. In most industries, if your workforce is not happy, um, you will suffer. And so there's a sort of strange alliance uh, that management has had uh, to, uh, to make with um, the satisfaction of its employees, uh, sometimes to really quite a, a, a deep level, um, and, uh, 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 and it's paradoxical, uh, given how work was organized for, for centuries. So work has become nicer, 
uh, for many people uh, because uh, niceness is the only way in which products um, will be effectively uh, generated in, in, in many industries. Um, the, the area of a company that is on the whole responsible for this area is uh, the HR department. Um, what is the HR department when it's not sacking you? It's essentially trying to make sure that you will be a happy worker. Uh, I went into uh, this accountancy firm happy to satirize um, the world of, of HR, but came away actually strangely impressed and fascinated by what HR people get up to. Uh, in this organization, they occupied a huge uh, part of the office, the whole of the ninth floor, dedicated to uh, uh, their mission, um, and they were doing all sorts of fascinating things. They were, when I was there, they were setting up a 24-hour anti, anti-bullying hotline, uh, which is basically that if you're in any way feeling humiliated or um, uh, uh, um, uh, slighted by, by um, your colleagues, um, you can pick up the phone and in utter anonymity speak to a trained counsellor, and the matter can be, uh, will be dealt with with extreme uh, sensitivity uh, and, and intelligence, really. Um, if you find that one of your co-workers has bad breath, um, and actually a case book on this in the HR department, um, there's, again, uh, you can call this line um, and report the problem. It's not an incidental problem because, not a, uh, um, a negligible problem, because uh, accountants tend to work in very small teams. They're hired out for uh, very high sums of money, and if clients notice there's a problem with a particular worker in this area, they may not invite them back, uh, and this could seriously affect the, the bottom line. So again, you can um, uh, call up a hotline, and within a two-week period, uh, an employee will be called in to do a course on something else, um, uh, letter writing, public speaking, but in the course of this um, uh, session, uh, you will be left in no doubt as to the importance of good oral hygiene, but in a way that is non-specific and will not leave anyone uh, embarrassed. So, uh, you know, it used to be the case that domestic life was the centre of sensitivity, of tact, of understanding, uh, and the working life was the centre for humiliation uh, and exploitation, a kind of Dickensian view of labour. Um, I don't think I'm being autobiographical to suggest that in many cases, uh, uh, that uh, equation has been flipped. Uh, and in the most advanced uh, workforces, uh, workplaces, uh, you get a level of civility uh, and, uh, uh, and politeness that domestic life is still struggling to catch up with. I know for one that I would sometimes return from my time with the accountants and it'd be a Friday night and my wife and I would be sitting down for dinner and the insults and the crockery were about to fly. And I was thinking, you know, where's the 24-hour uh, anti-bullying hotline now? Um, <laughs> But, you know, there, there just isn't. So, anyway, this equation I was fascinated uh, by. Another thing I was interested in was um, the issue of um, wasting time. Uh, as a writer, I'm obsessed by the idea that I'm uh, wasting a lot of time and that I just don't get very much done uh, every day. And I feel tremendously guilty uh, watching friends and family members going off uh, to the tube station, uh, thinking, comparing my life to theirs, and thinking that they are a hive of activity uh, while I sit there and um, eat Jaffa cakes. Um, <laughs> but but um, um, fortunately, the, my time with the accountants showed me otherwise. Uh, it showed me that, uh, fortunately, most offices are fascinatingly unproductive in all sorts of ways. Uh, compared to the average office, it's almost like a bucket uh, full of water, but it's got full of holes in, and as it's being carried along, the water is just leaking out. And it's amazing if there's anything left uh, in, the, uh, in terms of profit by the end of the year. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's utterly fascinating. Also utterly fascinating how many errors there are in every organization and how many errors an average organization can take. You know, something like 80% of decisions will probably be the wrong ones. Uh, but the organization survives and endures. And that's an extremely optimistic message. It suggests that all of us uh, have an extreme capacity to make uh, uh, mistakes, but also to tolerate mistakes. Occasionally, in uh, situations that we would call tragedies, you know, we step on a landmine, as it were. We step on something uh, that really has a disproportionately serious uh, impact on things. But for the most part, organizations and individual lives are remarkably flexible and tolerant of, uh, of, of error and, as I say, leaky of, of effort, too. Um, of course, this doesn't stop there being, in most offices, an incredible culture of um, self-sacrifice and hard work. Um, uh, in this accountancy firm, uh, incredible machismo about long hours. If you hope to get anywhere in the organization, you have to put in extremely long hours. Uh, in the, at 1 o'clock in the morning, there's always uh, a trolley that passes down uh, the corridors carrying pizza and Coke, and you have to do a few Coke and pizza nights a month, especially if you're in the junior ranks, to show uh, willing. And I remember one night, I was, uh, no, one uh, Saturday morning, I was watching a team of people people who'd been at work since the previous Friday, um, and they were working all night, and they were still at it, and it was Saturday, it must have been about uh, two in the afternoon, and um, I remember thinking, uh, I started thinking about the Sabbath, um, and, um, you know, wh what is the Sabbath? I mean, Sabbath, 
strange uh, Old Testament idea. God makes the world in seven days. On the seventh day, um, he stands back and asks us to admire his creation uh, and, um, and how fine it is and how hard he has worked. Now, what, what's this story really uh, about uh, from a secular point of view? What can a secular mind hope to do <coughs> with that story? I think it's really a story uh, about megalomania. It's really a story about reminding us that we did not create the world. Um, now, this is something that um, the workaholic finds quite hard to remember. Um, someone who works very hard is essentially sitting in the cockpit, what they perceive to be the cockpit of life, pulling the levers and having a very, very important role in directing not only their life, but the life of the company, perhaps even of the nation um, or the universe. But the, the truth is that most of the controls are unplugged, uh, and most of what happens is not directly connected to anything that we are doing. Uh, and the Sabbath is really an institutional attempt to remind us of this. It's not just good for our health. Uh, it's an attempt to make a psychological point about the extent to which um, events that occur to us are not necessarily in our hands. What happens to us is only tangentially connected uh, to our actions, uh, and that we need a specific amount of time in which that will always be made uh, clear to us. So the Sabbath um, uh, and the modern workplace. Um, see, the time is uh, uh, running Sure, but let me, let me just make a few uh, other, other points. Another thing that I um, was interested in in the, uh, in the office, and I hope I can hope we don't, hope we know each other well enough for this, is um, that offices are, are curiously erotic places. Um, um, now, let me uh, uh, qualify this. I mean, uh, we, we tend to pride ourselves in the modern world um, on how open-minded we are about relationships and uh, 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 matters of, uh, of sex and the body. And we tend to giggle at our Victorian ancestors who were incredibly embarrassed even by the sight of an elbow or a knee and were fainting at all times, etc. And we consider ourselves infinitely uh, superior and much more open-minded and able to tolerate uh, a, 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 you know, an open-minded vision of what we are as a, a sexual, bodily, physical uh, uh, beings until it comes to the workplace. Um, and I was fascinated when I uh, entered the, um, the workplace. I was given a folder, which is given to all uh, new uh, entrants to, to, to the accountancy firm. Uh, and it was a very uh, large folder telling you, you know, such things as um, you know, how much you can claim back on your receipts and how much you can spend on a meal outside the M25, etc. But there was one whole section of this fat folder uh, that was basically, um, wasn't called this, it was basically about sex. And uh, the, 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 to, to, to summarize it, really uh, the message was uh, don't. Uh, not, not with anyone uh, below you, uh, to the left of you, to the right of you, man, woman, don't. Um, and um, it seems to me that, you know, this was phrased <coughs> very much in the language of protecting the innocent from the unwanted advances of often male uh, uh, superior um, uh, uh, superiors in, in the office. I don't think that's the whole story. I think there's a strong element, it seems to me, of jealousy in this. Um, the corporation uh, is jealous. Uh, and the thought that it's really trying to repress through these codes of conduct is uh, the thought, very basic though it is, uh, that it may be more fun to have sex than to work. Uh, and it seems to me that any functioning society has to have that thought um, repressed, uh, that we have to, a certain amount of um, uh, abnegating of the libido is absolutely essential to uh, any working culture. And in this uh, uh, respect, our culture is no different from any other, though we pride ourselves on being so open-minded. So these, it's no coincidence that these rules are there. We've managed to sneak them back in. Um, uh, they were always there in, in, in various ways. Of course, there is a, an odd way in which um, injunctions and prohibitions against uh, sex have a curious way of making, of charging an atmosphere uh, uh, and... Um, uh, the, the other organization which, of course, prescribed sexual activity very heavily for centuries was, of course, the church. And um, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know if any of you know the work of Robert Danton, the historian of uh, early modern France. He wrote a wonderful book uh, a few years ago in which he studied all the books that were published in 18th century uh, France and analyzed them for, on a political basis and social basis, etc. And a, a whole chapter there is devoted on 18th century pornography. And uh, Danton makes a fascinating uh, observation observation uh, that 98% of all pornographic literature published in 18th century France was set in either a monastery or a nunnery. Uh, and I don't think it's uh, coincidental because, again, it fits into the structure of the church as a jealous organization uh, which prescribes uh, uh, sexual activity and nevertheless makes it more interesting in the process. And I was fascinated uh, a little while back uh, when some friends who I don't know very well, distant acquaintances, <coughs> people as I say who I hardly know, <coughs> told me that on the internet, something I don't really know about at all, um, uh, there are some sites dedicated entirely to sexual activity in offices, um, which seems to tell us an awful lot. And um, I, I'm going to stop that point.
point there, but you get, you get my drift. Um, I get, let, 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 let me sum up now, because we are really running out of time. Um, the, it, 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 I, don't want to follow, I don't want to follow only the, the sorrows of work, because I think that work is a, a, a very important source of, uh, uh, of satisfaction as well. And it's worth me just saying a few words about what I think these sources of satisfaction are. And in other words, what work can be when it's going well. Um, I think that at the heart of what we need work for is the word order. Uh, I think that we are uh, essentially ordering creatures. Um, we are creatures whose levels of anxiety uh, is absolutely uh, uh, fundamentally reduced by any activity which manages to impose order on a section of the world. We've come from chaos, and we will be returning to chaos. Um, uh, you know, the world before us was chaotic, the world after us will be chaotic in terms of our personal life. Um, and the world of work is uh, a world where, for a time, we're able to impose an element of order. Uh, and um, work, when it's satisfying, shares something in common, and I'm not simply being trivial, with the act of washing up, with the act of doing the washing up. Um, the reason why doing the washing up is quite satisfying uh, tells us a lot about what work is, about what work is when it's satisfying. Um, it's, uh, um, washing up normally doesn't take very long. It takes you know, 10, 15 minutes, and you transform a mess into something tidy. Uh, and you do so, as I say, in a short period of time, which allows you to see the journey from chaos to order. And I think that any satisfying uh, piece of work has in it that ability to take you from chaos to order in a time scale, which means that you can hold on to a picture of both and gain satisfaction from the contrast. Uh, and it doesn't matter what you're doing. It could be um, uh, you know, organizing data or organizing people or whatever it is. There are incredible, incredible links to, to the way that the ordering mind works. And you know, whenever you get people talking about their careers close up, you know, an architect and a writer get together, and then they realize that making a book and making a building are quite similar. Um, well, actually, the, surprise, the surprising thing is that's true right across the board, uh, that so many uh, of, uh, activities are similar because they have at their heart uh, a, a, a similar, that ordering uh, kind of impulse. The other thing that I think work allows us to do <clears throat> when it's satisfying is it allows us to be slightly better than we normally are. Um, it's very hard to get most of our life right. In fact, most of our life is a mess. But occasionally, uh, we manage through our work to make an island that is slightly better than the rest of us is, slightly more serene, ordered, logical, um, coherent. Uh, and I think that is where work is, in a way, a source of redemption. Um, and you know, I was criticizing. Uh, the workaholic uh, previously, but there is something about the workaholic <clears throat> that I think we can all identify with and sympathize with, which is somebody who perhaps can't get the rest of their life right and who throws themselves into work um, as, as a way of escaping from uh, intolerable uh, stresses uh, to which, as I say, we should perhaps be sympathetic because all of us probably have an element of that in us. Um, as I say, we can't be a success in every area of life. When we say that so-and-so is a success, um, we're always applying a value judgment. No one is successful in every area. Uh, and um, work, as I say, uh, is, is, is a part of our lives that sometimes it's easier to get right uh, than, than some others, and we can welcome it uh, for that. Um, I'm going to stop it there, because I want to leave time for, for your thoughts and ideas and questions. So um, do come back at me, but thanks very much for listening at least to this part. Thank you. <laughs> Just do stick up a hand if you've got any, any thoughts or ideas. You wait for, the, yeah. wait for the microphone. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, burgundy sweatshirt. Yeah. Thanks for pointing me. Um, that was really great. I love the breadth of your interest and knowledge. A uh, couple of things I wondered about. Uh, one, why would anybody want to be an air traffic controller? And two, uh, what do you think about prostitution? Uh, traffic control prostitution. Never had these thoughts uh, connected. Um, <clears throat> I mean, a little bit of background. I was, I was contacted uh, this summer uh, by uh, um, uh, BAA, the owners of uh, Heathrow, uh, who, who said to me, would you like to come and be our first writer in residence? Um, and uh, the, the 
the embarrassing thing was I was absolutely desperate. Um, and the reason is I've always been fascinated by airports. It seems to me that if you're trying to understand the modern world, the airport is a, 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 the kind of center where so many of these themes that make us modern come together. Everything from high technology, consumerism, globalization, the destruction of the environment, it's all there at the airport. These things that are normally often just abstractions come together as vivid, living things uh, uh, at, at the airport. So that's why I was very keen uh, uh, to hang out there. Um, I, when in, my, in my time there, I was able to talk to lots of people and did go and talk to some air traffic controllers. Um, the, the, the thing I learned, and perhaps doesn't quite answer your question, but the thing I learned from them, um, and this is something that tells us something maybe about work in general. Um, this air traffic controller I talked about at some length said, I can't allow myself to think about what I'm doing uh, in the sense of I can't allow myself to think that there are people in those tubes and I said, oh, well, why? And he said, well, because it would be so worrying that I might make them crash. Uh, he has to consider uh, these, uh, these people merely as abstractions. Uh, and I think maybe that's what we all have to do in order to get our job done. There are probably, in all of our careers, elements where if we were too conscious about what we were up to, the whole thing would collapse. And um, so I was interested in the idea that uh, while uh, in other parts of the airport, the, the dramas of individual actors, uh, passengers, etc., are, are right at the center of things. Up in the tower, you're just looking at things as, as dots on a screen, and you, it, would, it would impede your uh, uh, job to, to do anything uh, else. Um, prostitution, what do I think of prostitution? Um, I, I think, it's, I think it sh it, it sh it's on a continuum with other things. You know, um, I think we've all uh, come across situations, perhaps in our own lives or the lives of other people, where someone will go, oh, I'm prostituting myself here. So we use that word sometimes to um, uh, talk about something which doesn't just happen in that career called prostitution. Um, and that is really a moment in which uh, we feel that that balance between uh, work uh, as a free activity, work ac an activity we would freely engage in, and work as coercion comes together particularly uh, painfully. Um, and it's like that word slavery. Um, you know, word slavery and prostitution, they're quite close, historically quite close uh, concepts. Um, the, the dream of the modern world is to eradicate both prostitution and slavery, um, uh, but it has a habit of uh, clinging to the system. It's, um, it's about power relationships, um, and uh, we simply haven't worked it out, how to eradicate those power relationships, and so there will always be prostitution with a small P and a capital P, uh, so long as we can't um, properly sort out um, issues of exploitation, really. Um, other thoughts? Oh, yes, you've got a microphone. Sorry. Um, hi, thank <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I thought that was really interesting and quite funny as well. Um, I think I need to start by declaring that I'm a career changer. I feel like I ought to say that. <laughs> I used to be a doctor. I was a psychiatrist by training, and then I decided to jack it all in and become a parliamentary official, which is what I'm doing now. Um, but I've never felt more fulfilled because I'm doing both my parliamentary official jobs and I'm also locuming and doing the occasional psychiatric clinic. And I was struck by your observation that as we've become more specialized in the workplace, the humanity from work seems to have disappeared. I also noticed that you cite yourself as three different things, philosopher, author, and entrepreneur. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, one of the things that I've found is that since I've had two careers, I feel better. And I was wondering whether portfolio careers is the way forward. Mm -hmm. In, in order to address that issue of losing, um, losing humanity as we become more specialized. Yeah. So that was the first question about portfolio, portfolio yeah. careers. The second question with my psychiatric hat on is, have you managed to escape that feeling that most of us get on Sunday evenings when we have to go back to the workplace? Do you feel fulfilled in the workplace? Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, the portfolio career, it, it sits fascinatingly in, in the modern world because it's a moment where our dreams confront a reality. The dream is the Renaissance man or woman. Um, you know, that's the dream. The dream is, is one in which work will be an arena in which we can fulfill our many, many talents. Uh, and that runs headlong into the economic uh, virtue of specialization. So we've really got two goods clashing. It's a classic a sort of liberal conflict where uh, you know, the desire for uh, the expansion of the soul in many directions uh, is hampered by something else which we find very worthwhile, which is a specialized workforce which can generate the sort of wealth that we see as very uh, welcome. And if you listen to Adam Smith, is in fact the guarantor that the bottom 10 to 15% of the population won't starve. 
Uh, we need a specialized economy, according to Adam Smith, because it's only this that will prevent the famines uh, that beset uh, less uh, uh, specialized economies. Uh, and that is still, at the end of the day, the biggest and most powerful defense of specialization and a consumer society. You know, we shouldn't defend consumer society by how intelligent and wonderful it is to have so many varieties of ice cream. We should defend it on the basis uh, that it actually prevents the bottom portion of, of the population from suffering um, it very intensely. Um, and so um, that's, that's, I suppose, a, a kind of irrecon slightly irreconcilable conflict. I think you're very lucky, it sounds, in the sense of having two uh, uh, careers. Um, the, uh, the rude word for people with many careers is a dilettante, uh, someone who can't do one thing very well. And there's that tension in, in our society. We know that many, many jobs can't be done uh, by someone who only does them uh, two days a week or three days a week. Uh, and it's sad because often the blocks to them being done on a part-time basis are institutional. Uh, and to do with custom rather than to do with the fundamentals. So if you talk to architects, most architects will say things like, you know, you don't need to train for seven years. You, know, you could probably do this in, I don't know, you train for a year, you probably do it. But of course, you can't do it because there's, there's you know, guilds that prevent you from, from doing it. And that's not just in the world of architecture. In many, many worlds, you get this sort of specialization. So that prevents um, the broadening of, of the individual. And it's incredibly painful, um, absolutely. Um, to, uh, leads me on to my next, uh, your next part of your question, which is about me and Sunday evening. No, I'm a, I'm a great veteran of, I should say that all, I write all my books from personal problems, uh, this one not, uh, no, no exception. Um, like everybody, you know, uh, I'm very happy to do what I do as a, as a writer, but I'm constantly struck by limitations. Um, a book is, on a bad day, can seem like a very small thing uh, in a huge and turbulent world and a very small attempt to change something. And uh, there are moments of impatience. Um, I think that I am somebody who uh, believes in the power of ideas to, to try and change things. And there are lots of areas in which I want to try and change things. And I'm aware that books are very good uh, in some areas, but uh, faulty in, in others. And I think that might be the origin of that last, uh, slightly curious word, entrepreneur. Uh, I helped um, uh, last year to set up something called the School of Life, uh, which is uh, an institution not that uh, different from the Forum for European Philosophy in that it, it aims to um, uh, use philosophy, but culture more broadly, uh, to engage with the problems of everyday life and to have an impact on, on everyday life. And that's just one example of something I'm trying to do. But it's, um, you know, it's horrendously difficult, and I know at first hand that it's, it's very hard to go from being you know, a writer on Monday to being I don't know, a, a mini HR department with a crisis on Tuesday. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not romantic about that. Um, other thoughts? Yeah. Is it thought? Thanks very much. Uh, work is important for us and for most of us. It's a very intimate part of our lives. <coughs> But it, it is a journey as you, as you evolve through, and I'd be interested um, in how you react to a, a Doug Hammerskill's uh, quote that uh, the greatest journey is not you know, where you've traveled or what you've done and so on, but it's actually how your mind develops. And the key part for me from, from the work experience would be not to have stagnation, and that you know, it's, it's the journey within that's perhaps much, much more greater rather than the, the status and, and all the other mm. things. Look, I, I absolutely agree that the, that the dream of work should be that it's a process of growth and, uh, and self-discovery and uh, the perfection of, of the individual. Um, but of course, balanced against that is the perfection of the corporation and the bigger unit in which the individual operates. So, um, and this is something that you know, comes back to education, where I was trying to say that the, the education system suggests rather your view of work, that work could be that your professional life that's waiting for you after you've passed all these exams will be one in which you can develop your talents in, in, in many areas. Um, but there's often a rude awakening, and it, it tends to happen um, when people leave uh, higher education and enter the workforce. There's often a very rude shock when that dream of individual development and authenticity that, that I think you're alluding to comes up against the demands of, of the workplace. There's um, a, a friend of mine who runs a, helps run a, a small uh, media company told me that they just employed somebody who was 23, straight out of university, uh, and uh, that there was a sort of intriguing moment when Generation Y or whatever it is crashes into the workplace. You know, they were having a discussion uh, about the way that a certain film should be, should be shot, and everybody was uh, uh, discussing this and pitching in. And in the end, uh, uh, my friend, sort of, who was the boss, called the meeting to an end and said, well, I, thanks very much, but I think we'll do it this way. And uh, this uh, young graduate came along and said, well, that's really interesting that that's your view. I, I can't agree with you, and I think perhaps we should revisit this. 
And he sort of had to clear his throat and say, <clears throat> you know, I'm the boss. Um, and this is a moment, I suppose, it, it struck me because that's really a moment when it shows that there, is, there are structures of hierarchy and authority that deeply violate that dream that, that, that is otherwise proposed by other sections uh, of society. It's almost as though, I mean, it does reflect, um, even to, to, for a sort of Marxist analysis, it does reflect two things that capitalist society needs. Capitalist society needs two things. Uh, on the one hand, uh, entrepreneurial spirits, uh, self-starters, authentic people who want initiative and who don't want to be under the cosh of somebody else, who want, uh, don't want external authority, desperately need those people. And it also needs people, uh, so it needs sort of spontaneity, but it also needs people who will be uh, willing to be coerced. It needs, as it were, a, a large workforce which will be more or less acquiescent to, to rules and discipline. So it needs, so, so, and there's a clash uh, very often in the education system between, um, uh, if you like, uh, you know, authenticity and coercion, clash. Uh, and this is something, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a conflict within our own society, and it's something that all of us, uh, as we work through a working world, are probably going to have to encounter, and how we make our peace with it you know, will shape our, our careers, obviously. Yeah. There's a question right at the back. I'm really intrigued by uh, your idea about uh, <coughs> domestic life and work life and how almost the can be, I mean, nowadays can be flipped, like almost the, the, the importance of the work life has, I mean, far greater impact on the way we experience life than domestic life. I mean, do you have, I mean, any further thoughts on that and also how this has effect on culture, the way actually, I mean, creative culture and the way, I mean, yeah, people live and the way people kind of structure their thoughts and kind of how they participate in reality. Yes, I mean, um, you know, there's obviously been a lot of noise about work-life balance and uh, how to juggle work and so-called uh, life. It, it reflects our society's difficulty at pricing. Um, you know, one of the things that went wrong in the uh, uh, current economic uh, crisis was a problem about pricing, i.e. We, did, we didn't know what value to put on things. There's been a tremendous readjustment of pricing and hence of value. You know, the value of a banker is now at least socially very different from uh, what, what it was. Um, we have a very difficult time uh, putting a price on things which don't have a direct economic outcome. Uh, not, not indirect, but direct. Uh, so we're very bad at calculating externalities. Um, what's the value of a good mother? You know, we have a very hard time deciding that. Uh, what's the value of a good value of a nurse? You know, et cetera. Um, we, we, we don't really know. Um, or indeed the mothering function, if I can be more uh, general. Um, and uh, we don't know how to put a price on it because we don't know. We, you know, our, our instruments are too crude for calculating the benefit of something. Again, a tremendous amount of uh, economic work to be done in, in trying to get a handle on this and trying to come to a more sensible uh, vision of things. Uh, and it's because of this that we, um, that we have this problem with work life. Um, we, we don't know how to get the right balance. I think the idea of balance, though, is a naive one. It's a classically bourgeois one. Um, the bourgeois world is non-tragic. By non-tragic, I mean that it, does, it refuses to accept that not all good things can belong together. It refuses to accept uh, that, um, that there is perhaps no solution to certain things, that there is no solution which won't involve a severe loss in some area. Um, and... So just as I was suggesting that bourgeois marriage is this kind of win-win dream, and bourgeois work is this win-win dream, you know, money together with satisfaction, love together with children, etc. Uh, this is a denial of certain tragic realities of existence, and work-life uh, balance is again an attempt to smooth over a tragic fault line in life. As I try to suggest, you know, we can't all be successful at everything, um, and um, the person who is successful in their career is on the whole unsuccessful at family life. Just, it's just a, a true thing, you know. Um, uh, I've observed both sort of scenarios. And I think the answer is not so much that there is some ideal um, uh, 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 reconciliation, but there could be a more conscious approach to choice so that we know what we're trying to be successful at. Um, in, by realizing that we can't be successful at everything, uh, it gives us potentially a chance to be more honest about what we have a, a decent chance of actually being successful at and uh, um, leads us to be able to face that choice more consciously and more uh, with, with greater kind of insight. So that's what I would say about that. Yeah. Yes, what's my view of boredom and, uh, and, and, and work? 
Um, of course, the dream is never to be bored, um, but psychologists tell us, um, and I think they're right in this, uh, that things happen when you're bored. Um, that what looks like boredom is very often a process of just trying to figure out what comes next. Um, and that if you were never bored, you would, you would miss out on all sorts of quite vital processes and uh, kind of states of mind. That's a sort of, that's good boredom, uh, if you like. Of course, there's probably uh, dull boredom, uh, I mean, truly uh, uh, mindless boredom. But there is perhaps a useful uh, uh, sort of, of boredom in which we're preparing to find something uh, uh, more, more interesting. Um, I think the fact that many of us are bored for, for periods of the day also uh, suggests how much work there is to be done in um, trying to find out when people are actually doing their work. Um, most jobs still have a very mechanistic model where you have to show up at a certain time and leave at a certain time. Um, and management wants to see that you're there because otherwise they think you're not working. Of course, we all know that we're very bored and doing nothing at our desks. But management thinks, well, because you are there, uh, you are working. And of course, this is a very, this is a failure, really, to understand what you want out of your workforce. Uh, management that knows what it wants out of its workforce will let their workforce work wherever they like, whenever they like, because they've got a way of quantifying them. Um, as soon as you don't quite know why you need your worker, you want them there at 9 o'clock, just in case something comes along and you want to see that they're supposedly doing their thing. Um, again, my hope for the future is that we'll get better at um, working out when people are working and when they might as well be having free time, being bored, free associating, etc. So that those moments of boredom when we're at work but chained to the desk uh, will, be, will be less. One, one last question. Let's, let's take one last question. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned that um, like workplace put it, are actually for putting uh, things in order, and we come from chaos, and we're going to go to chaos. But don't you think that it's actually contributing more to chaos? I don't think that work is contributing yeah. more to chaos. Be uh, yeah. um, I mean, a lot of work, of course, does uh, uh, contribute to chaos when you need to think of the environmental uh, impact, etc. Um, but I think that, uh, uh, I mean, well, well, we need to be extremely cynical uh, to think that um, all work was simply about destruction and uh, exploitation and the, um, uh, simply the generation of more chaos. Um, I think it's probably true to say that 50% you know, or so is, product, is genuinely productive and the rest is probably isn't. But um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't edge towards the cynicism that would suggest that all work is simply adding uh, to the chaos. I think that most of us at least want work uh, to be unchaotic and to be productive. Um, and that's where I think, again, economics gets us wrong in thinking that we're, we want to be selfish. Um, uh, there's an amazing amount of selflessness. And in fact, most organizations would collapse very quickly if people did merely what was on their job description. Uh, you know, if you read the average um, contract uh, according to which people are hired, um, if people just did that, uh, society would come to an end. I mean, the, the wheels of industry would lock uh, because so much of what people are doing in the workplace is bringing the whole of themselves to the workplace and bringing reserves of goodwill and energy and kindness and forbearance that were really, uh, that are not being paid for anyway, that were created normally in families, normally by mothers. Uh, the word mother, I mean fathers too. The maternal uh, instinct, the nurturing instinct. And this goes into the workplace. The true HR departments of global capitalism are families, um, or, or the units that, 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 that create uh, uh, effective uh, workers. But this isn't paid for. So again, thinking of externalities, this is free stuff. Um, so we come to the workplace not just intent on causing chaos, I think, but insofar as we feel relatively sane, and all of us are a bit insane, um, sometimes big portions of our lives, but all of us are slightly unhinged, but insofar as we, we manage to get on an even keel, we, we do have the interests of others and more than ourselves at heart, and, um, and, and we try and, uh, and exert ourselves positively, I think. Um, on that note, um, let's, let's stop it there, because otherwise we'll, we'll all get um, uh, too tired, but if you want to uh, come and say hello, please do. I'll be signing books outside, and um, I just want to say thank you very much to all of you and also to the Forum for European Philosophy for hosting me uh, tonight and on so many other occasions in the past too. Thank you very much. <laughs>